thank you all for coming today <laughs> um, to, uh, to uh, one of our fabulous spree lectures. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge the people, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we meet today. And then I'd like to uh, introduce you to Mohammed Degani Madva, uh, who will be speaking to us today on economic, environmental and social factors in local PV module assembly. Uh, Mohammed has uh, been here for four years, completing his PhD thesis, which he finished in December, like was um, awarded in, acknowledged in uh, <laughs> December of 2023, and he started as a postdoctoral fellow with us uh, at the beginning of this year. So um, join me in welcoming Mohammed, and I look forward to hearing the presentation and all of your questions from the audience later. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Renata, for a kind introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about economic, environmental, and social impact of local manufacturing. So I would like to start my presentation with this fact that we need to transit to more renewable energy to combat climate change. And we know that solar is going to play and it is playing very significant and critical role in that matter to combat climate change that will, will need it. While we are doing okay in the demand side and we are deploying PV, almost okay, but we are not doing very well in the supply side. There is a huge vulner vulnerability in the current supply chain, which is heavily concentrated in Southeast Asia, specifically in China. As you can see this figure, this is market share of China in different segments of PV manufacturing in 2018 versus 2022. As you can see, it is growing and keep dominating the supply chain. This has become kind of pose a risk and vulnerability to the current supply chain, uh, which uh, somehow we need to diversify the supply chain to, because this vulnerability uh, can, uh, any disruptions from natural disaster or any geopolitical tension can disrupt this supply chain. The other issue with the current supply chain is some ethical uh, problem. There is some ongoing argument against uh, using forced labor practicing in the current supply chain. So we need to diversify this supply chain. But this is a huge challenge. But we have also an opportunity during the last decade, the required capex in supply chain is just decreasing significantly. And among entire segments of the supply chain, each sub, uh, value chain, module assembly required the lowest capex and lowest technology know-how. So I believe that module assembly could be the best, not the best, but the good fresh start because it needs lower uh, investment, which can translate to lower risk for investors. But this is not all. Uh, comparing the economic benefits of required material for making uh, in, uh, input material for making each of segments in supply chain, as you can see, for one gigawatt production of module assembly, there is economic potential economic value of hundred million dollars to supplying glass or aluminium locally, compared to other segments completely out with other segments. But more than economic benefits, if you go beyond economic benefits, there are also social and environmental benefits in module assembly compared to other segments. For making one gigawatt module, uh, worth of module, you can see we need about 500 jobs compared to other segments. And also an environmental impact compared to other segments, except polysilicon, there is still room to make greener module. Uh, so economic benefits, social benefits, and environmental benefits. And also we know there is a risk and challenge in the current supply chain. So this provides an opportunity with the huge market value in future that we can target. The blue line shows the cumulative install capacity so far. As you can see from 2010, with 30 megawatt installation in Australia, to 2022, we reached 30 gigawatt installation in Australia. And if we're going with the same pace, in 2030, we can reach 300 gigawatt, which is worth about $3 billion. So there is a huge market. And if we keep going, there is more than that, about 100 to 300 uh, worth of uh, module market value in future. So having this challenge and opportunity to target that 
And also, these benefits, my PhD is based on four main questions. The first question is, okay, if you want to make module inside of Australia, how much does it cost? What are the cost categories that can impact the module price? And if you want to compete against imported PV module landed price in Australia, what is the price gap? Is there any price gap? And the next question start here that how we can bridge that price gap? What are the ways, what are the approach that we can make local manufacturing more competitive? Should we increase our production capacity to benefit from economies of scales? Or is there any type of policy, supportive or protective policy that can help us cover that or bridge that price gap? Again, going just beyond economic impact on social and environmental front, is there any way we can create jobs, still have lower price of the module? Imagine you're gonna answer four gigawatt demand in Australia. Should we go with one big gigafactory and create jobs or should we have separate centers and create more jobs? What are the trade-off between creating jobs and having min uh, and minimizing the cost? And then what about environmental impact? What happens if we choose greener supply for an input material? Instead of China, we import every material from Germany, which has greener supply, a greener electricity mix. Is there any trade-off between cost and environmental impact? And how we can kind of treat that uh, trade-off between these two objectives? And my last question to answer was looking at the bigger picture. What happens if we want to have all three objectives same time and having this multi-objective model and is there any compromise point between these three objectives or which one we should take care of should we go to a lower economy uh, uh, lower price or should we uh, take care of our environmental impact so let's just start with the first question this is my research framework and how my model works so we have different suppliers around the world with different type of transportation that they can send their input material, required input materials to Australia. Then we have Australia with different locations inside Australia for making module and then answering demand. And there is, again, different type of transportation. Should we use ship? Should we use train? What happens if we use train? What are the best uh, practice in terms of cost? Let's just start with economic optimization. Uh, when I start my PhD in end of 2019, I start to model in uh, early 2020. My first challenge was what type of economic parameters or economic metrics should I choose to compare making module inside Australia with imported module from uh, other suppliers? Because if, if I want to compare production cost with imported module, it is not fair because imported module also include the margin. So I choose minimum sustainable price. MSP, which is short for MSP, uh, which MSP stands for minimum sustainable price. So MSP defines as enough return on your investment. So we have internal rates of return. So if you set internal return on your weighted average cost of capital, whatever your co capital cost structure is, it's your business based on equity or debt. If you set your return to that to answer your capital cost, you have your minimum sustainable price. You can gain enough margin to have a sustainable business. Then second challenge was uh, data availability and uncertainty in the data. So the cost data is really hard to find like really accurate data or it is not available at all. So what I did, I add Monte Carlo simulation to economic optimization and have the stochastic model and target four cost category. First, initial investment to make module, then how much we need to produce module, how much we need for logistic cost and what is the trade cost between them. And you can see some of the assumption. I choose production capacity uh, to make 600 megawatt module inside Australia. In 2020, uh, 600 megawatt was about 15% of the market. Now it's like 12%. So I said, what happened if we import input materials and answer 15% of the market and how we can compete? So my initial result in 2020 was if you want to import everything in Australia and make module to answer demand with enough margin to be sustainable business, we will end up with 32 cents per watt. But since 2020, many things happened. Those disruptions happened, like pandemic happened and impact material uh, short, resulted in material shortage and also impact the logistic. 
Also, there were some, uh, I guess, three different incidents in polysilicon production factories in China that resulted in polysilicon shortage. As you can see, from 2020 to 2021, which is the uh, pandemic hits the most, the supply chain, uh, the MSP rose to 38 cents per watt. And there is also technology improvement, like the mainstream technology from M2 in 2020 just moved to M6 with higher efficiency in 2021. And on early 2023, uh, we, which is the kind of we are in duration of post-pandemic, everything just going back to normal and we reached to 31 cents per watt. So this is the MSP of making module inside Australia. But what happened if you want to compete against imported module? So in the next step, I start to model the price gap between imported module in Australia and locally made module in Australia, and then extend my model to other location in the world. So as you can see on the left figure, it's Australian case study. So if we import everything from China and make module, we end up with 31 cents per watt. But if we import module from China, on average, we will end up about 24 cents per watt. So there is seven cents per watt price gap. And you can see in other markets, we kind of experience the same things because the main reason that price gap is almost the same in different uh, location is that uh, if we assume the globalization factor is labor cost, electricity cost, and logistic cost, and tax in each country. We have different tax, and that impact your internal rates of return. Because the material cost has the dominant share, so the price gap in each location around the world is almost the same. As you can see, it's 73 cents in Australia, and it's 76 cents in Germany. So this was my first question. How much does it cost to make module, and what is the price gap? So what was the, my, my second question? How we can bridge that price gap to be competitive in Australia if you want to compete with imported material? So one way to do that is to increase the production capacity and benefit from economies of scales. So let's see what happened and which capacity we can be competitive in Australia. On average, when the imported module price is about 20 cents per watt, we need to reach almost to 10 gigawatt production capacity on average to be competitive. So the initial investment for, for that 10 gigawatt, it's around 630, uh, uh, 630 million dollars, which is a huge investment. And this huge investment, it means huge risk. So should we go for that risk or is there other way? To find out that if there is other way to kind of support local manufacturing, I did an extensive comprehensive literature review uh, from uh, and targeted three countries to see what they have been doing to protect or support their local manufacturing. I used China, Germany, and US for obvious reasons that they have practicing like producing PV through the course of uh, uh, supply chain PV manufacturing history. As you can see, I just go for after reports, news in Chinese language, in German language, to find an evidence of that policy happen or not. So I found a pattern. Sometimes countries support their local manufacturing by injecting money in different cost category. They pay half of the capex. They, they give them free interest loan, or they pay for the labor on the first year, or the electricity price. So I found the first approach is that supportive. They just support local manufacturing by injecting money. And the second approach was they protect their local manufacturing from international suppliers. And they did it almost in three ways. Even if they impose tariff on imported material to make it even and balance the local manufacturing and imported module, sometimes they put capacity on a specific country or, or even a specific supplier. For example, that supplier only can answer 50% of the demand and not go far. And they call it import quota. And finally, there was an approach that they completely put away a supplier or a specific country or a specific company from the market. And they call it import embargo. To see historically what happened, this is the module production in China, US, and Germany. And the start point show uh, when supportive policy happened. And the dot point show, uh, the circle point show the protective policy happened. And the line represents uh, on log scale the amount of production in each country. 
I should mention that it doesn't include any information about how much they invest. It is just indication they started that. So for example, for China in 1998, it was a kind of investment on CapEx for uh, uh, silicon manufacturing. And then everything is stopped, and, until to, uh, and from 2004, huge investments start. So this is just representative indicating that when they start that policy and uh, what happened to their production. So having that in my mind that, OK, there is a way to support local manufacturing, I start to quantify their impact. The first one was uh, production credit, or you can call it uh, manu local buyer's incentives, or you can call it in Inflation Reduction Act, which is currently happening in US. The amount of direct incentives per watt of production. So in Australia, on the, right, uh, on the left figure, you can see in different, because as I said, I add Monte Carlo simulation to treat those uncertainty. So on average, we need about seven cents per watt to be competitive. But when we become break even, when we hit IRR at 0%. So in 0%, if we incentivize about five cents per watt, we reach break even point in our business. And if we keep going extra two, two cents per watt, we will have a sustainable business on a minimum return. But there is many ways that you can play around with, it, with, with these incentives. One way that I explore it, it was what happened if they incentivize their local manufacturing based on the production capacity. Like if you have, if you have like 10 uh, centers and they want to produce module in different range, obviously the one that has highest production capacity has lower cost. So if you just give them like seven cents to all of them, it's kind of unfair uh, like a playing field. It is not even playing field. Again, it depends on government perspective, how they're going to treat. Are they going to pay for the first four years and then wait and see what happened? You can play around uh, with type of policy. So the second option was to see what happened if we support each cost category. So what happened if we pay 50% on equipment? What happened if we pay 50% on facilities? And we keep going on each cost category. As you can see, if we don't have any policy, which is shown with the red, uh, in, in red bar charts, we need to reach about 10 gigawatt production capacity to be competitive. If we pay 50% of the capex, this competitive production capacity dropped to around 8 uh, gigawatt per year. So you can see each of them are not enough if they, if they act separately to completely bridge the price gap that we were talking about. So uh, in Australia, you can see we have Tindo with nominal capacity of 150. And this is the average announced production capacity in US, which is about 2.2 gigawatt. So you can see if, for example, only we rely on equipment incentives, we need to have 7.5 gigawatt production capacity per year to be competitive on average. So what happened if we combine those policies? So I examined five different scenarios. On scenario 0%, I assume that there is only production credit incentives. For 600 megawatt capacity in Australia, the government should have three, should uh, needed to pay 305 million over seven years for 600 megawatt to make it competitive. So in the scenario 25%, I said, okay, what happened if we pay 25% of upfront cost and the rest by production cr credit. And I keep doing that until reach the point that in a scenario that government pay 100% of equipment costs, 100% of facility costs and everything and the rest by production credit. And I found out in this scenario that government kind of pay upfront cost and then give the production credit, the amount of co commitment kind of dropped down to 253 million over seven years. Again, this is really uh, on the government perspective. How are they going to reach out? Because if, for example, government say, OK, I want to give you 300 million over seven years. So there is interest rate on each year. So the value of money will change. So the government decide, I will give you the money at the first year. And I will keep going. So it depends if the government have enough money to pay you or government thinks that, oh, it's better to give you each year uh, I don't know, half of, the billion, half of the million and see what happened 
and keep going. Then this is supportive policy. The other approach was protective policy. So what happened? So in supportive policy, we basically say, this is where we make it, and this is where we import it. Let's make it even. But in protective policy, we say that, OK, we cannot inject money, so let's bring the market price up to match with local manufacturing. So obviously, the drawbacks of this approach is that people are going to pay more for their module in your market. So in the in a scenario that you just want to protect your local manufacturing and you don't have, for example, any glass supplier in Australia, and you don't care, you say every input material can be get in Australia without any tariffs, but we need that amount of tariff on module to make local manufacturing competitive, which is in this case is about 32%. So basically, if you impose 32% tariff on your imported module price, you can reach the competitive point. But what happened? If you have, for example, glass manufacturers inside Australia and you, are not com you cannot compete with Chinese glass manufacturers and you try to protect it, which is what happened in Germany, which I will show you later, that they have local, local glass manufacturing and they impose tariff just on glass. So when you impose tariff on glass, what happened? Your local manufacturer is going to pay more for that glass. So the local production cost goes up. Again, you need some extra tariff on module to make it even. And you can see in a scenario that you have like cell manufacturers, glass manufacturers, and all of like input materials manufacturers, and you impo impose 50% tariff on each input materials that come to your country, you need 83% tariff on your imported module. So what happened? Your price gap increased to 20 cents per watt. So Basically, people and consumers are going to pay 20% higher for their market, which is not good things if you want to transit to more renewable energy. Finally, the other two approaches on protective. One of them was import quota, and the other one was import embargo. So on the base case scenario, everything from China. What happened if we impose 50% limitation on Chinese imported material and say just they can answer 50% of the market? Then the next supplier will be showed up. And in this case, 50% by China and 50% by Vietnam. So your module price goes up by 9%. And in a scenario that you ban, for example, a country, and you should go to other suppliers, for example, if you want to go with Germany, the price go 41% higher instead of just bring everything from China. So these are the impact of tariffs. So obviously, you can play around with those policy and combine them. It depends on as I said, government perspective. Uh, so let's have two cases study what happened in Germany right now and what happened in the US. So in Germany, as I said, there is some tariff on glass, imported glass, which is, again, it depends on a company from 20% to 92%. And also, there are some incentives, like they have incentives on capex, they have incentives on land, they have incentives on labor for the first year, so all of those incentives drop the cost, but those tariffs on aluminum and glass increase the cost. So without any policy at all, the uh, MSP in Germany would be 30 cents per watt. But when we impose all of those policies and all of those uh, incentives and protective policy, the MSP rise to 32 cents per watt. So that doesn't make sense somehow. You spend money. You receive some money from the tariffs, but still people are going to pay more in their current market. In the US, if we have China as a main supplier and if we have Vietnam as a main supplier, we have different range of tariffs and input material in the US. And these tariffs, again, uh, it really depends on which company. It comes from 20% to 400% tariff on a specific material. So if you import everything from Vietnam, in US, and with those, all of the tariffs and also uh, protective like Int Inflation Reduction Act, you can be competitive. But what happened, you increase your market price and local manufacturing uh, price because of those tariffs. If you import everything from China in a scenario that import everything from China, what happened, you, again, you can be competitive because that Inflation Reduction Act is really generous. So what happened, you increase your market price to 60 cents per watt. So you can imagine how this impacts the customers and for their solar projection. So let's see how 
money flows between different parties. We have government that spent some money on, the, uh, on incentives, and we have tariff that government collect those tariffs, and we have people that pay more in these two scenario. If you want to compare them, in a scenario 100% that I showed you, if you just incentivize local manufacturing, government pay about $300 million over seven years, and customers will not pay anything more on the, what, what is the market price. But in a scenario that you import everything from China, you can see how much government spend, how much government collect, and how much people extra pay on their solar project. Uh, on their solar project. Uh, this was my first and second question on economic optimization. Then if we go on a social and environmental front, let's just start with environmental uh, impact. We can import material from three different countries, China, Germany, and US. And they have different electricity mix. So they have, for example, Germany is greener because uh, its electricity mix is about 47 on renewable energies. So what happened if it decide go green and import everything from China? So there is a trade-off between importing everything from China and make it module, or even importing module from China, or importing module from uh, Germany. This is, as you can see, the carbon intensity per each material and transportation to import that material to Australia. So the greener option obviously is Germany. The total emission or carbon, the total carbon intensity would be 140 uh, kilogram CO2 per kilowatt. And the worst case scenario is that if we supply material from Australia, because we are not greener even than China, Germany, and US. So we find out there is a trade-off between minimizing cost and minimizing environmental impact by choosing supplier and transportation costs. So when you change your supplier, your transportation road will be changed. To import everything from China, imagine, or import everything from Germany. You have different transportation emission. Uh, as I said, in the best case scenario, if we just minimize CO2 emission, model said, OK, bring everything from China and make it in Australia. And your carbon intensity would be 140. And if you want to just minimize the cost, the model say, OK, bring everything from Germany, uh, sorry, from China, and your carbon emission would be 180. Uh, total, your carbon intensity would be 180. So in order to find the trade-off between this point, what I did was set the model, OK, go green completely. The model say, OK, 100% everything from China, uh, from Germany, sorry. And your price would be around uh, 51 cents per watt. And then you 100% achieve your environmental obje objective. And I said, OK, I give you this constraint that you can go a little bit further on your carbon intensity. If I set the model, the carbon intensity is 140. The model said, OK, everything from Germany. And I said, OK, you can, realize, you can be relaxed on, the, uh, on that constraint with extra 20 carbon intensity per kilowatt. The model said, oh, OK, we can import 20% of input material from China. And again, rest should be bring it by Germany. So I increase that uh, carbon intensity constraint to see which point is the best point. Obviously, this is Pareto optimal. All of the points are optimal. But it depends what you're going to do. Do you want to go green or do you want to go like with the cost? For example, in the middle point that is like 60%, 51% by Germany and 49% by 48% by China, your price would be 40 cents and your uh, carbon intensity would be around uh, 155 something. Then I said, what happened if we import everything, all of the input material from Germany, but we impose carbon tax or carbon border adjustment? If, if we start with zero carbon tax from here, we know that the price gap between importing everything from Germany and everything from China, it's about 14 cents per watt. And I impose different range of carbon tax on the border. Even if we go to $1,000 per kiloton of CO2, it is not enough. $1,000 is a lot right now. I guess the most aggressive carbon tax right now, it's in, I guess, Sweden or Norway, it's like $170 per watt. If we go to $1,000, it is not enough because the price of material is significantly different, different between China and Germany. So if we impose 100 
Uh, and this is just for module assembly. And if we impose $100 uh, tax on imported material, carbon tax, we just shrink the price gap to 10 cents per watt. We are still, we cannot like compete, uh, like importing everything from Germany, importing everything from China. Still China would be better, even if we impose $1,000 carbon tax. And next, I go to the social front and see what happened? Uh, is there any relation between creating job and minimizing the cost? So as you see on the right figure, when we increase production capacity, the number of created jobs increase. But the number of created jobs per production capacity decrease because of economies of scales. So if you, pro if you produce on 10 gigawatt, per watt you need less workers, or you, you, you generate less jobs. So I found that there is a, a kind of connection between jobs and minimizing the cost. So if you want to, for example, answer 80% of the demand, which is about four gigawatt, if you want to just minimize the cost, the model said, okay, just choose one center, four gigawatt, and enjoy the economies of scales impact, and you can produce at around 30 cents per watt. Different lo at one location in South Australia, everything there, and from that point, answer the demand. But the number of jobs that you can create, it's about uh, 1,700. I said, okay, what happened if you wanna have more jobs? Maximize the number of jobs that we can create. And the model said, okay, we need now seven centers. 600 megawatt, and you can create about uh, 3,000 jobs, but your price reached to 40 cents per watt. So again, there is an interaction between creating jobs and minimizing the cost. So as you see, when we are achieving our economic objectives, one center, four gigawatt, and the number of jobs that we can create is about uh, 1,800. And what happened if we want to have other centers at the two end, uh, at, uh, on the very end, and we create lots of jobs? Seven centers, but see what happened to their uh, cost and how many jobs we can create. Again, any point here can be your answer. And this is the Pareto optimal points, Pareto optimal sets. It is your preference or government preference to support jobs or minimize the cost. And finally, on my last question, I try to see the bigger picture. What happened if you want to have all three objectives together? And what would be the cost? How many jobs we can create? And uh, what is the carbon intensity? So on the y-axis, you can see carbon intensity. On the x-axis, you can see the number of jobs. And the color represents the module manufacturing process, MSP. So it, on the dark blue area, it's the lowest price. But, but at, as you can see, we have higher environmental uh, intensity, like our carbon intensity is high. On the uh, bottom left, you can see it's the best point in terms of environmental impact. We, but the cost is high and the number of centers is just one. This is why, because we, when we have seven centers, Basically, you need to transport within seven centers, and from seven centers, you, you need to transport to your demand location. So you increase your emission. This is why the model choose that center. So every point can be your answer. Uh, not uh, obviously, some of the point, it doesn't optimal. For example, the, the white line, if you see that, a point, if you move from A point to point B, we are still staying at the uh, same MSP, but we decrease the number of jobs, but we make better environmental decision. But from point B to point C, it's, it's, it is not optimal point, it is not optimal set, because when we go from point B to point C, we don't do anything better on environmental, but we decrease the number of jobs that we can create. So there is trade-off between these objectives, and there is a way, uh, it depends on the perspective of the government, what decision you want to make. Creating job, being greener, or, uh, 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 or uh, have lower MSP. And uh, so uh, what I left behind, uh, so obviously you can uh, extend, there's a question, what happens if you extend the entire supply chain into the module assembly and go to sell and wafer? So in this case, how much would be the MSP? 
and how, uh, how when you quantify the cost of support or protective policies, what happens? Should we have, again, just supportive? Should we combine them? Each segment react differently. And uh, in which segment Australia can be competitive? Or should we go after, as I said at the, my second slide, there is economic benefits of making module by providing input materials like glass, like aluminum. Should we invest on them? And if we invest on them, do we need support? If we want to manufacturing glass inside Australia. And also there is some limitation. It's the, the cost data availability is really rough. And the dynamic is moving so fast. So I keep updating the model and my result is based on a year ago. It's like 2023 because the data is not available and it's not inserting. Uh, also, there's some intangible factors that is really hard to quantify, like the relation between suppliers or the bargaining, you know, how they can uh, drop down the price when they want to buy, for example, as a supplier, what is the negotiation? Uh, how can I negotiate and have like lower price compared to other manufacturers? And also the, lear the learning rate of manufacturing. Because we assess the impact of economies of scales based on learning rate, if we have a center in Australia, does that learning rate apply to Australia or a new facilities have different learning rate to reach that uh, point that they can enjoy the economies of scales impact? And uh, uh, out with an impact, uh, we uh, kind of published three papers. The last two, it's in Joule. The last one just, uh, I guess, uh, become online one week ago. And also I contributed to two reports, Israeli and Solar Manufacturing Opportunity and also S2S report. Probably you heard about it. And at the end, uh, I want to thank my supervisors, <laughs> Renata and little groups, I guess. Renata and Nathan, uh, uh, they were more than supervisor to me in the last four years. And uh, without their help and support, uh, I really couldn't you know, explore my ideas and different things. So uh, I was thinking how to appreciate their help. So the only word came to my mind, they are not supervisors. They are super supervisors, to be honest, <laughs> super supportive. And also I want to thank my uh, family and my lovely wife. And uh, again, they're super family and she's super wife. <laughs> thank you, thank you for listening to me. Mohammed for a, a, a really, I think he, I think, um, a <laughs> well articulated uh, description of, of a significant body of work. Um, there's a lot, even more than you've seen here, there's an awful lot that goes on behind the scenes, behind all, the, all of that data and lots of other scenarios explored. Uh, I'm ha I think we're, we're happy to take questions if anybody has some questions. Yep. Um, so slide 32, you've got that um, color graph. Yep. Yeah, I was just wondering about like, so down and to the right of the compromise point, there's kind of that bump going on yeah. where you've got about the same price, less environmental impact, more jobs. And I'm just wondering why the compromise point is where it is. And is there a reason it's there and not down there? Yeah. Uh, again, the compromise point, it depends on your perspective. So here, I choose compromise point, then my economic objective is like 80%, and my environmental and social objective is close to 80%. And the line that you can see and go further is like, the model changed the number of centers. Like, the model at that point, it's a good question actually, you can choose and say, for example, in that point, what happened in that point? So the model say, okay, I choose three center for you, you wanna answer four gigawatt demand. It's like one, two gigawatt center, and then the rest is 600 megawatt. So the number of job and your MSP would be different on average. Or at the same point, if you go down there and say, okay, instead of import everything from Germany, I import a little bit from China, and instead of having seven centers, I go with four centers. So this is why the model, like the lines go curve like that. Did I answer your question? I uh, think. I think at a high level, it's because there are s some of it is linear and some of it are step changes, so you don't end up with nice curves. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, this first. I was earlier. Wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, help, Mr. Um 
Thank you for the nice presentation, first of all. Um, I would be interested, so if I'm thinking about to, to divide, let's say, a quantity like six gigawatt into smaller pieces, how that would that looks like for me a very controlled initiative from from the government to say because but there should be if if these are entities which make profit how how would you make that because if i think about finding an investor he would like to optimize his return on investment looking at the lowest cost to be competitive yeah. so i think this is a kind of um thing i i could not yeah. How would you, do you have an idea how that could, could, could be transformed into reality or what kind of control mechanism? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And yes, I agree. Uh, every investor is looking at the lowest cost instead of investors just want to profit. They don't care about environmental or uh, social jobs. But there, uh, this bring, up the, uh, bring forth the chance that governments say that if you go with two center I mean, and create that job, I will incentivize you per job. So again, that's a trade-off point. I don't go, I, 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 I don't model it as an investor and I'm not modeling as a government. I just say this is the parity optimal point. So governments say that, okay, let's choose three center and per job that you create, I give you, for example, $100. So can you do that and can you be uh, cost competitive? So this is again based on decisions that go and each party can have their own interest and make their own decisions. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, thanks for a great talk. Uh, so we made a lot of progress. Uh, I've seen your work from very close. If we can go to slide 23. Um, this, um, yeah, this is one, one of the examples because if you look at local yeah, local yeah. manufacturing of part of the supply chain. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of flow and benefits from that as well. So job creations, the, these people pay tax, these companies pay tax. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's included now. Um, the 29 million lines is the tax that companies should pay back to the government, which is in US is like 15%. No, so I mean for the supply, like the local, the local manufacturing. Yeah, 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 the the local manufacturers, this twenty, uh, the twenty line, twenty million line here, represent tax that the manufacturers should pay the government, which is like, as I said, fifty percent on margin. Yeah, but there's also like um, uh, tax on people, obviously. So, so the employment tax, etc. So the benefits are actually larger, and then you have a multiplier yeah. effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are you planning to include that? So, both because you're looking at uh, increasing the value chain, but also the supply chain, go a little bit deeper because I think the economic impact. Uh, so there's, there's there's good figures for that, yeah. and I think then it could look, uh, I think even more favorable because now you say like yeah, it looks like we're paying, we're paying more, but actually the benefit, yeah. the overall benefit could actually be a lot uh, higher than what we, what more we pay apart from just the profit tax. Yeah. So fifty percent. Not sure. The, I think the, fifteen. Yeah, I think it's what. Yeah, we're twenty-five. So fifteen. I would say it's probably far too low. There's a lot more tax. Sorry, Germany is fifteen percent. U.S. Uh, when I did the U.S. for twenty-eight. It depends on the location in U.S. I guess in Cali uh, this is based on California location. So it was twenty-eight percent, and Australia was thirty percent, thirty-three or fifty. Australia thirty. I yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, but I mean, if we also take like the employment tax, etc., into account, then I think it would be, it would look more favorable. And actually, that's also what we want to achieve because, of course, um, yeah. it's it's about the whole country, the yeah. whole uh, yeah company yeah. Australia. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good point. But uh, I need to stop myself at some point because if you want to explore anything, and also to add to your point there is indirect job as well. So I just go after direct job. So there is indirect job, induced job, there is like uh, another impact on overall economy. But my target was just on a company and uh, I assume that there is just only that tax. But yeah, to your point, uh, local benefit would be more than that. Yeah, and I think it would not be too difficult to explain your model with that. And I think it would, yeah, would be a more realistic case and the numbers would look better. Yeah as well. Yeah, yeah, but I still believe uh, you cannot compete with imported PV module. If you, one, uh, one of the uh, uh, challenge to that is how you want to quantify those benefits in terms of cost. 
you are making module in Australia, for example, on 32 cents, but you know that there is more benefit, as you said. People are going to pay more tax and stuff like that. How you want to quantify some of those impacts, it's hard. For tax, I agree, it's easy, but some of the quantif quantification... I think there's probably published literature on that where you can take yeah, reasonable assumptions there, so there's the multiplier yeah. effect, for example. And of course, yeah, I don't think we're going to... like it's, It will not uh, be uh, cheaper than China, but then it, the, the difference will probably be smaller and then and it will require less money, so it will make it easier. Yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I haven't done it, but yeah, it would be good to, I can explore it in next. And then um, on slide 17, and that's, um, so you, you mentioned that you assume seven years for, like, if you have an equipment, uh, like, so CapEx support. Um, so the experience in China is now that they replace equipment every three years. Wow. Yeah, indeed. Wow. Um, yeah. So basically, which means if you don't replace it, you will be uh, you'll be a generation one or two behind in technology. Yeah. So that's something. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I would not know how to integrate, but something to take into account. So this uh, equipment cycles, it's shocking. So in Perk it was every three years, and I think for Topcon, it's likely that we're going to see that as well in module. Uh, part of it was also they have to go to more bus bars and, and your stringer just uh, is not compatible with that. We'll go to zero bus bar very soon, likely requiring investment in there as well. So I think the seven years is probably it's a bit optimistic <laughs> <laughs> and it would just and then the question is because you see this typically you uh, people are paying willing to pay a lot more for relative more for if, if product is a little bit better a module if it has a higher efficiency. So it's important to take that into account because if your modules are, it's not just comparing on what, but it's also if you can get better products from China, that that will also make it a bit more difficult. Yeah, I'm not sure how you would integrate that, but it's important to take that into account. Seven years, I don't think it's. Yeah, that's that's really good point. I didn't know that uh, in literature. I saw ten years as well. Like it's even. Uh, now no way. Like uh, speak yeah. to companies. So we have very good contacts. So Pierre Valind is visiting. Yeah again soon we can ask that question but i know from yeah from, yeah, from yeah. the perk the line it was three years yeah the way to your point the way that we can it's it's actually easy to add those notes because uh the lifetime of equipment shows in depreciation cost so how much they're going to depreciate over seven i assume seven years so if i change for example seven years to three years basically uh sorry just so Basically what happened, the depreciation cost a little bit shrink and also the margin a little bit shrink because the margin based on the tax that return on investment, initial investment. So yeah, yeah, thank you for your point. I, yeah. I can explore that, yeah. My, my comment goes a little bit in the same direction. Um, so you, you assumed like 500 um, employees per one gigawatt, right, for the module manufacturing. Yeah. I heard that they are now extremely fully automized, going down to 60, 70 person, even below that. So I think the degree of automization is, is, is so much increased in the last years. I think that would be a very important point to consider. Yeah. Um, because it's especially if you go in towards creation of employees and so so because I, I think you will not be competitive if, if you go with these high numbers that's my and another point I would like to raise is the, the quality insurance cost maybe you could think about that one because um, the, the new kind of technologies they need the best kind of wafer quality very rely otherwise you cannot get these these high efficiencies uh, low distribution levels and so on um, so so if you make modules you have to look for cost for quality insurance also so the, the question is I think what what would I think that would be interesting to look what what is the cost for it and um, that could be an interesting point to in in the analysis because uh, a lot of companies, they, they see a big benefit if they have the full value chain and can control everything, what they do in order to optimize everything. So if you have only a piece of value chain, you, you have to import, of course, uh, your cells at the end. And uh, what is the cost involved for that kind of quality insurance? Yeah, uh, thank you. That, that's, that's a really good point. To your first point, and also answer to other points, it's really hard to find data on that. On the insurance cost, I remember I started 
I had a meeting with Martin Green, and he mentioned also that point that, okay, what happened about insurance cost? And I, uh, it was like 2021, I couldn't find any like <laughs> cost that say that any, any, anywhere in any language that they, okay, you need to pay that extra on your insurance, or you need to pay that extra money, a company come and take your module and make sure that it's completely okay. So for the first one, uh, your point about the labor-driven or machine-driven equipment, again, it's really hard to find data. The only data I found in literature was even worse. That if you, the idea of is when I search for that data, the idea was to see that if a country cannot, uh, don't doesn't have enough money to invest in new equipment, what happened if go and buy the second-hand equipment and start the like uh, manufacturing getting to the market? So. There wasn't any data at all. The, the only data I found is for two, uh, 2018, I guess, uh, that you can see the labor-driven and machine-driven scenario. But in my analysis, I j only go after machine-driven machine-driven scenario because it makes sense. If you have lower labor, it means you your uh, MSP would be lower because of the labor cost. Yeah, but yeah, I agree. Those points are uh, really good, but it's really hard to find. I mean, maybe I think you can work with assumptions. Um, in a certain way, you can you can make maybe a, put an assumption inside your your analysis and say, okay, I reduce the labor cost, uh, the, the the amount of employees by a factor each year, or something like that, which um, maybe I think yeah, it's, it's in, in, in with a model you could you could do a lot of things. Yeah? Exactly. Because you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, that is yeah, but maybe uh, the uh, the fixed point for your models could be um, historical data, but also. Re really talking to to manufacturers in China because they so much highly automated and then you see how much people uh, are involved uh? but yeah, and, and then and then you can draw a line and say okay if say okay I think uh, th this is the model I could I could put inside my my economic model that's an idea that's that's a very good point uh, so the way we model uh, I modeled it it's based on Python and I upload it in my github so and there is an excel sheet that you can put your input and run the model so there is different options and assumptions that you can go after that and try to uh, minimize your kind of assumptions and conditions but yeah that's that's a really valid point to <laughs> consider those things thank you. one more question Oh, there's a classic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll be quick. Um, so um, generally now with the module manufacturing, you kind of see manufacturers kind of uh, separating their manufacturing into utility scale with rooftop, and now also niches are coming in like floating PV, BIPV. So do you have you looked at maybe there is a certain category of uh, modules that maybe Australia can look at, which might make it more cost sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's. That's a good question, and uh, again, it's based on your assumptions and the data availability. So my assumption was based on a half cut perk uh, by facial, which is kind of better for utility scale, obviously, instead of residential. So it depends on data availability and your, your assumptions, and you can play with different assumptions. So yeah, to your point, if we know that, for example, if we go for after a specific technology, the market value would be that much and we can be competitive, again, we can try it with the model. But yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to um, thank you for all the great questions. I'm going to um, close out the meeting now. <laughs> I will say that um, over the four years that Mohammed has been working on this um, project, uh, the Australian market hasn't changed very much. Four or five gigawatts a year is what we've been doing over four years. But everything else has changed and it changes every year. So the initial concept around a 600 megawatt factory, we know we need to rethink that. In the process, we, we rethought, we, we moved the, with the technologies to half cut cells. Uh, we've changed the module size, we've changed all sorts of things and we continue to do so as the market changes. But it moves so quickly that the models and then the getting a paper published, we're always <laughs> a little bit behind <laughs> the market. <laughs> so um, uh, thank you for all the great input because I think we continue to develop this and we're already working in detail upstream into the silicon supply chain. So it's, I watch this space, I think there's lots of interesting things to come. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today and let's all give Mohammed uh, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.